Midway family. Sorry for that technical difficulty there. Can you hear us? Everyone was just so excited. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, Midway family. Sorry for that little technical difficulty there. Let's but try this one more time. Let's try this one more time. Everybody Hi, guys. was just so excited. I know. That's what happened. We Luke is back, guys. I'm so honored that you're yes. here. I'm well, glad I heard, you're here. I heard that while I was gone, this became your show, like Kimberly's Corner. You know, it is. So uh -huh. welcome. I, I think I'm I should to be get a guest. little coffee mugs, you yeah. know. And a and sofa. Kimberly, yeah, there we go. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. I won't be as, like, up close as, like, Drew Barrymore is with her show, you know. Gotta well, get I mean, you could be. Distance. I probably could get it, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I well, won't wear so makeup. Happy. Yeah. Yeah. We're so um, happy to have you back, Luke. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. You yeah. Know? All things. It's just, yeah, good to be back and uh, I'm feeling good and good. ready to get back involved. And, you know, we got a lot going on today, so I'm just yes, excited. Yes, of course, of course. Did you have a good week, though? What yes, you, what I did. Were you up to? Uh, well, it was spring break for most people, but yes. since it was spring break, I actually kind of hopped in and out of the office here at yes. Midway Church, uh, and just to kind of get acclimated and kind of uh, readjusted after yeah. you know, a month and a half or so. And so it felt good to be well, back good. in the saddle. So yes, good. hopefully I'll see everyone around slowly but surely. You know, can't meet three thousand people quickly. Of course, but yes, yes you know, yes. in and out. So it'll we're be great. so glad you're here, Luke. I had the privilege this week. Um, my husband and I, for those who don't know, we're foster parents, and so we actually got to provide respite for our foster daughter's siblings this weekend. So I had three kids. I went from no kids last year to one kid to now three kids this weekend. So triple the fun. Triple the fun, and I had and a lot crazy. more fun than I had yeah. anticipated. So you know, I I was really glad, and I'm glad we got to do that. And uh, respite care is so needed. So if you guys ever want to know about foster care and respite, that's that's such a special thing that you can give to foster parents um, and one way that you can help out so that's very special I yeah, say, yeah cool. I was glad to do it and we we had fun watching her interact with her siblings um, but we have some announcements guys next Sunday is baptism Sunday um, but we like to make the joke that every Sunday is baptism Sunday yes here. it has been yeah. it has been and I think we have seven today um, in the second service so yeah it's yeah. crazy God's doing amazing things right yes, now. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to um, chime in the chat in a minute, the link um, or the email for Laurie, for you guys who are interested, if you're interested in coming next yes. week for Baptism Sunday, getting signed up. Um, she's going to be your point of contact. And if you guys are here... Look for that email address yes. somewhere in whatever In the feed chat. We will get it following. in there soon. Yes. Um, and if you guys are here um, in the worship center and want to talk to somebody about getting baptized, um, we will have plenty of people out in the atrium and in Next steps. The next steps area. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So either one. If you find a staff member, we will get you set up. We promise. Start asking around for Leslie Pear and you'll yes. find the way. Yes, I promise you. And then we also have the Sewing Peace Conference. So Luke, tell us about that. I don't know a ton yes. about it because I haven't had the privilege of attending yet. Yeah, so Ken Sandy wrote a book about peacemaking. And what okay. peacemaking is, is we all have conflict in our lives. And it's an opportunity to take Christ's perspective and approach in both a spiritual way, but in also kind of almost a secular way of just being able to respond responsibly deal with some of our emotions and some of our baggage and then uh, bring that perspective and empathy into helping others. Okay. And so that conference is happening here April 18th through the 20th. And so we're just honored to have that. Uh, it's uh, actually a regional conference. So they're coming in as a partner with us yes. and as a ministry partner to set up that conference. So if you're interested, you can register online. Yeah, we have that information um, available on the Midway website through our events tab. So if you want to check that out um, and go check out the pricing and everything, it's going to be a great time. But it looks like it's time to worship. Man, that's yes. so bye. <laughs> let's do this. Yes, let's have a great day, guys. We're so excited to worship with you.
with you today. There's somebody you haven't said hello to yet. So will you do that now? Will you say hi and welcome them to Midway?
Good morning, Midway Church. Good to see you here. You can have a seat for just a moment. So glad you are in the house with us. Whatever you've brought with you today, God is ready as you make room today for all he wants to do. We're going to worship him. And we got a blessing. We got a lot of blessings, don't we? But I want to tell you about one. Some of you may have seen our online hosts before. One of them today was Pastor Luke Hughes. He's in the house today. Yes. He's behind the scenes, he's serving right now, he is using his gifts, still can't be around people a whole bunch just yet, but we wanted to welcome him back uh, today. Just what a blessing, we prayed for this moment for him and he's here serving and what a blessing and joy it is. It's also a joy to give, uh, if you're new with us, maybe you're back from Easter, we have no expectation of you if you're new here, but we give every week. You'll see ways to give on the screen because God has given everything to us. We give back with all that we've got uh, financially, with our time and our talent, whatever we do. And because you did just that, because you showed up, church, I want to tell you last Easter, last Sunday, was the biggest Easter ever in the history of Midway Church by large margins. You've got some praise today. Yeah. We had over 5,000 people on our campus throughout the week, five services, the most serving roles ever that we've ever needed in any given week in Midway's history. And you know what? They were all covered. You know why? Because of you. Because God is doing an amazing work in our church and people are leaning in just like you. We're seeing God do exceedingly abundantly above anything we could ask, think, or imagine according to his power working in us. God's ready to do that in you. And I want to share a story with you now that I believe will prompt your heart to see the forgiveness, the peace that God wants to bring about. We've got a conference coming up here soon that's all about sowing peace and dealing with conflict. You got any of that? (laughs) I figured you did. Well, through turmoil, through conflict, through life and all its journeys, peace is possible. And we want you to hear Janae Alexander's story right now so you can ponder what it looks like for you. Check this out. Hello, my name is Janae Alexander. I um, am a mother of... um, Three, I have um, a, a child in heaven um, who he passed away at seven, and I have a, a daughter, and I have a stepdaughter, and I um, am married to the love of my life, David Alexander. We've been married for six years. Um, so Bryant Joseph uh, was born uh, May 13th of 97, and he lived uh, to be seven years old. I married um, Kevin in actually early 90s. Um, His family had a camp uh, in uh, Southeast Louisiana, and it was something they loved spending time with family, and July 4th was always one of our favorite times of year. My husband and my son were doing what they loved best on July 3rd of 2004, and um, they were involved in a boating accident, and it took both of their lives. It changed, it changed our lives. No one ever wants to get that call. The only words of condolence that we didn't receive was from the driver and the driver's family, um, the driver of the boat and the driver's family. Five years passed, 10 years passed, and so our paths never did cross. And I honestly, you know, it just, you go through the motions, you, you start your life again. So there had been times, honestly, that I'd wanted to reach out through the years, but honestly, you know, it, like I said, we lived 500 miles away from the family involved in the accident. Last spring, um, my husband, David, received an email inviting us into Peacemaker uh, training, Peace Sower team training, and so my husband said, let's do it, and it really wrecked me. I don't want to withhold another day of withholding forgiveness, and so I reached out. He responded to me within two or three hours with such grace and said, we have thought about you and your daughter every day, and we've wanted to reach out to you, but wanted to respect your privacy. And so I said, can we meet? And he said, absolutely. It would have actually been, it was the day before the 19th anniversary of my late husband and son's passing. So... We drove to New Orleans, and my daughter and my husband were with me. uh, And as they approached our meeting place, I could just tell, I could sense that they were just not sure how this was going to play out. 
And so as they walked toward us, I could just see and they were just shaking visibly. My first response was just to wrap them up in a hug. Um, but I asked if we could just say a prayer and say, David, let us in prayer. We all held hands. And I just started speaking from my heart. And I said, I just want you both to know that I can't imagine you all carrying this for so long. And that your identity has always been more than the driver and the passenger of the boat. Your identity is a child of God, just like I am. It was so deserving of forgiveness. And if you'll allow me to do so, I would like to take us in forgiveness to you all. I don't have any questions. You don't owe me anything. Um, and at that moment, the late, the wife of the driver of the boat literally just placed her head between her knees and just wept. And there was such freedom and forgiveness for me, and I know freedom for her. And I'm oh goodness, thinking to myself, like, this was, it was so needed. And I see lives changed. I see lives changed because of it. I see their family moving past and seeing that God's just worked a miracle in my daughter and I's life. And it just so happened as we were leaving, I said, y'all have a wonderful July 4th. And they looked at me and said, we, don't, we haven't celebrated that in 19 years. And my daughter said, no, you have to do two things. You have to listen to Lee Greenwood and you have to have cupcakes because that's just what we did. That's what we did with our family. And the, the wife of the boat driver said, I think we'll do that. Like, I think we'll start a new tradition. And don't wait another moment because forgiveness is truly for you. But to be able to give a gift of freedom I know most, not everybody has that opportunity to do a face-to-face. -face. Um, but for me to see the, tr the transformation and just the burden lifted, that's a gift that only I could have given. There's no reason why any of us should withhold forgiveness. All God's people said. Can we give God some praise for Janae's story? Yeah. Janae's one of the sweetest people I've ever met in my entire life. And through her journey and her story, you can see loud and clear that God's forgiveness is real and it changes everything. His grace is enough. So today I hope you know that for you and I also wanna share with you on your journey of discovering and embracing God's grace. We're excited to celebrate those stories, just like Janae's, like the stories of baptisms that we're gonna have. We've got seven baptisms in the second service today, you guys. Can y'all give God some praise? I wanted you to know that. You can tune in with us and check that out. You see the evidence of God's grace all around us. His goodness is all around. Will you see it? We've got a big baptism Sunday, next Sunday. Every Sunday is that for us here, probably notice. But we've made a special day of it next Sunday. Maybe you need to be a part of that. So I want to pray for those being baptized and for you as you just embrace the goodness of God in your life. God, thank you for Janae's story, for this conference that is coming up in April 18 to 20. And God, I pray that others like Janae will participate in that, Lord, through the conflict, through the turmoil of life, uh, it's way more than a conference, is this concept, God, of your peace and forgiveness being offered to sinful, broken humanity. So God, thank you that we get to participate in such a moment as you created in Janae's life. And as we're gonna see in second service today, we pray over those seven lives that have been changed by Jesus, many through our Easter services. God, we celebrate your goodness today. We worship you in spirit and in truth. God, thank you that you are so so good. In Jesus' name we ask it all. And all God's people said, amen. Let's continue to worship.
Still I lay my head Yes, I will sing Of the goodness of God We sing Hello again, Midway. What a great morning. We've had church here today already, haven't we? Man, I thank God for the stories, the lives changed, the worship. Aren't you glad that we serve such a good, good father? He's so good to us. And maybe you're in a season, though, where, like you just saw in the video, it doesn't feel so good. 
Maybe you're dealing with doubt. Maybe you have discouragement or despair. I don't know what brought you here today or what you've tuned in for, but I welcome you into God's presence because he has never left. He's always been after you. He's still looking to your heart today. Will you let him speak into your life? If you're new with us today, if we've never met, I'm just so glad you're here. Maybe you're back from Easter. Uh, I am so thankful for what God did over Easter, but here's the beauty. I got good news. You want to hear it? He is still risen. He is risen every day. Every day is Easter Sunday when you follow Jesus. So, hey, I'm pumped to kick off this new series today called Deconstructing Doubt. Deconstructing Doubt. There's this movement over these last several years. You may have heard different definitions of the word deconstruction. There are people that really I would call it more of a deconversion mindset where they would say, well, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I gave my life to Christ but I deconstructed it all and found it to be false, and now I am no longer a Christian. I don't know if you've heard of some of those movements. It's been called different things. It's looked different ways, but here's the reality. We all have a commonality in that kind of a conversation, and that is that we all have doubts. Secrets out. You got them too. <laughs> Me too. We all have doubts. So I want us to look for our six weeks now, we're going to look at what it looks like to get to the core of the heart of what our doubts actually may be and hopefully find some confidence as we strip things down all the way to the core of the truth of who Jesus is and of Christianity. We're looking at deconstructing those doubts because we all have a journey where our faith is constructed. You're constructing your version of what faith looks like even now, but there always comes a time where there's some deconstruction because there's unlearning. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Unlearning things in religion. <laughs> I always say I am a recovering Pharisee. That's the unlearning of religion that I have to go through because some of the things I've constructed that I think are right and true, I've had to unlearn some, as much as I learn. That's why I often tell new believers like, man, you're not contaminated yet. Don't let people like me contaminate you. You keep your eyes on the word of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And you know what, though? You can do the same thing. So we're going to take a, an often hijacked term of deconstruction and flip it upside down and look at it for what it is because when we get to the core of what it actually looks like in your own faith, you can deal with doubt. That's what I want to talk to you about today, dealing with doubt. We're going to look at how I doubt salvation next week. If you've ever doubted, can I really know for sure I'm saved? Come next week. It's our big baptism Sunday. It's going to be an amazing day. We're going to talk about doubting God, doubting science and faith. We're going to talk about doubting the church. I love Jesus, but I'm not so sure about the church. Maybe you've been hurt by the church. We're going to do all of those things. But today, I want to set a tone for dealing with doubt. Now, how many of you as a kid like to take things apart? like to tinker with things. That was me. How many of you are super inquisitive, always asking questions? The annoying kid, that was me. <laughs> always ask a million questions. I loved baseball, and so I'm the type, it's not just my faith, anything in life, I want to take it apart and know the why behind it. I want to know what's at the core of everything. So I loved baseball. And so I remember, I don't remember how old I was, but I was a pretty young child, and I got a saw and a knife, probably doing something really stupid that I shouldn't have been doing, but cut into a baseball, because I'm like, what's in a baseball? And I cut that thing all the way through the string. You ever look? It's pretty crazy. All the way through the string, all the way to the little tiny core in the middle, little ball in the middle. And I kept that thing a lot of my childhood just because I wanted to know what's in the middle of a baseball. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Maybe you found that out. <laughs> But that is actually deconstruction. When you look at its definition, it's really what I did with the baseball. It's really taking things apart and examining something. So we want to do that, yes, with faith. But really, if we're honest, if we're going to deconstruct, take apart, examine the core of our faith, we really have got to get to the heart and to the core of some of our doubts because they go together. Yes, you heard it here first. Faith and doubt do go together. Let me explain as we go through things today. So here's why we're doing this series. If you've got doubts, I want you to know I do too. And we believe, here's the statement that we're really building this whole series off of. We believe that the church should be the safest place in the world to deal with doubt. How many of you have been in a church before where that statement did not hold true? Where when you had doubts, yeah, me too, me too. You had doubts and then it disqualifies you from maybe even showing up. 
And certainly from leading or certainly from serving, but I want you to hear something. We choose to meet people where they are. It's one of our core values. We choose to fight for unity. We choose to do what God has done because every human matters and every human has doubts. We meet people where they are. Therefore, Midway Church is a safe place for you to wrestle with your questions and your doubts. We declare that as we start the series, and that's also why God led us to do it. You also see this very truth that Jesus, that's not my idea, by the way. That was Jesus' idea. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. But the kind of church Jesus built is one where that truth, that the church should be the safest place for me to wrestle with my doubt, that was Jesus' idea, and it's seen even from what we often call the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, if you got your Bibles, let's go there together. Get this, it's actually the same chapter where Matthew records the resurrection. We just came off of Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday celebration, but you see this truth. You see Jesus dealing with doubt among his disciples. Now, Jesus appeared over the course of 40 days after his resurrection, he, re he died a real death. He really did die. He really did rise from the dead. He's not in the tomb. He's still risen, church. Aren't you glad? But 40 days in between his resurrection and his ascension, where he goes back to be with his father, and he leaves his church to go and build the church that he had established to begin with, he appeared in the Gospels alone some one dozen plus times to people or groups of people. In certain cases, a crowd of over 500 people just in case you thought there were no eyewitnesses to the resurrection. But one of those appearances was on a place that we believe is Mount Arbel. We've been there, those of you who went to Israel with us recently this last year. It's a place where he gave what we call the Great Commission. What is it? It's the marching orders. It's the mandate. It's the mission of the church. And he gave it to his disciples. And so even there, we see how Jesus dealt with doubt. Now, I've preached the Great Commission many, many times before, and you'll see God's people. You'll see God's power. He says, all authority has been given to me. You will see God's purpose to make disciples. You'll see God's plan, baptizing and teaching, and then you'll see God's presence. All five of those things are in this passage, but that's not the outline I want to preach to you today. I actually want to walk through verse by verse the Great Commission because it actually gives us a great outline for how God deals with with doubt. You intrigued? Let's dig in together. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 is where we'll start. If you're ready for the word, give somebody a high five or fist bump. Let them know. It's time. Let's dig in. Matthew 28, verse 16. The word of God says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some, but some doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. May God bless the reading of his word in our hearts and lives. I hope it just sprouts like a seed, turning into an amazing, thriving, living truth in your heart and in your life and in your relationships this week. So Matthew 28, the Great Commission, same chapter as the resurrection. Jesus has appeared to his disciples, and what we see here is the power of God, the purpose of God, God's plans, God's presence. But at the heart and at the beginning, many times we jump to those latter parts and we miss the God's people part in verses 16 and 17. In fact, when you hear preachers read the Great Commission, most of the time it jumps to verse 18. But I started in verses 16 and 17 because that, my friends, is the point of this series. Picture the moment. Jesus has defeated death. The ultimate victory of victories. And this Jesus, who they saw and knew and loved, has died. And now they're hearing rumors that he's appeared. And by this point, he's appeared to even some of them. Already, we know. On the sequence of events, this was a little later into those 40 days, and he's appeared to them. And they are literally looking at the risen king of kings, the conqueror of death, a guy who was dead who is standing in front of them. He told them to go to this mountain, Mount Arbel where you can look and oversee this big international highway. You can see the Sea of Galilee. You can see the landscape where he had walked and talked with them. 
It's an amazing landscape to look at. They are staring at Jesus. So what do they do? Two things. Verse 17, they worshiped. Good response, right? They worshiped. But some, they're staring at him, but they doubted. I don't know about you, but this passage actually is pretty comforting to me. It's like, well, they were actually looking at Jesus and doubted him, and I can't physically see him, so maybe I'm actually not so crazy after all, huh? I don't know, maybe there's just a little self-affirmation in there that I'm looking for, but this passage actually comforts me because they had doubts too, and they're literally staring at the face of Jesus. So why do we doubt? I don't know, there's a lot of reasons. I give you a few. One is just tough questions. I call it just tough questions. Deuteronomy 29, 29 is one of my go-tos. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. That makes me doubt sometimes. I don't like secrets. <laughs> God, I want to know all your secrets. How about you? I want to know everything. The secret. circumstances, don't they? Tough questions, tough circumstances, a loss, a tragedy in your life, something that has just caused you to question the very existence of God, the existence of God in your life. You, it's caused you to question yourself. It's caused you to question life in general. Tough circumstances cause us to doubt. Maybe somebody hurt you. Maybe somebody in the church hurt you. We're going to be talking about those things too. Tough questions, tough circumstances. A third reason we doubt is I just call it human capacity. <laughs> Like it or not, man, I just can't quite figure out the mind of God. I know y'all thought you had a pastor who, who understood everything about God, but I got the news flash for you. I don't. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and my finite human capacity and ability to comprehend God is just not big enough to know everything about God. And that causes doubts. It causes questions. It causes confusions in this earthly tent, Paul calls it, our human bodies as we walk in the flesh. I heard a preacher say a long time ago that a fully comprehended God is no God at all. If I could fully understand him, then I'd probably be him, and I certainly would have no need for him. But he's the creator. He's the sustainer of the universe. He knows what I don't know, so I can trust in him. But man, that's hard. That's good preaching, preacher. Woo, Amen. But I got doubts. Well, the disciples did too. So I want to give you today some truths about doubt and faith. I'm going to give you five of them. Truths about doubt and faith. One from each verse of the Great Commission. I hope it's a blessing to you. Number one, write this down. There is a difference between doubt and unbelief. Verse 16, it says that the 11 disciples, there are 11 of them because Judas has betrayed Jesus and has taken his life. Again, tragedy. What You talk about doubts and confusion and questions. This guy that walked with us and walked with Jesus and knew Jesus, you ever seen some of that? You talk about deconstruction or deconversion or whatever words you would use to describe the journeys of people's faith around you. They had just watched Judas betray Jesus and hang himself. They had a lot of doubts, but they didn't have unbelief. A lot of times what we think is, is a deconversion, well, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore, might just be God stripping things away like that baseball to the core of what faith actually is to begin with. And I want you to know today, we know this statement is true because of the disciples. It says that they went to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. That's verse 16. So they believed so much so that they obeyed. But they still had doubts. They had doubts going on, even though they believed enough to obey. Did you know that was possible? A lot of times in religion, it's like, well, we've got the perfect faith. Y'all show your church smile one more time. Perfect church smile. We got it all together. I don't have doubts. I don't, you, you have doubts? Oh, man, I'll pray for you. <laughs> no. We all, the disciples were staring at Jesus. They believed him enough to obey him and show up to that mountain that he had directed them to so that he could give them the great commission. There's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Here's the difference. I'll give you a few today. Doubt is really a matter of our mind, trying to wrestle with these truths, but unbelief is really a matter of the will. Here's what I mean. Doubt means I'm processing truth. I'm trying to get to the core of the baseball. 
I'm trying to get to the heart of what faith is actually all about. Doubt is me processing truth, but unbelief means refusing by my will to acknowledge and accept the truth that has been made real to me. There's a difference in the two. Unbelief ultimately is out of rebellion, where doubt is out of oftentimes just a troubled, processing mind, or maybe even a broken heart. There's a difference. So just because you have doubts doesn't mean that, well, none of my faith can be real. It means you're wrestling, just like the disciples did. And, and I got news for you. This is the bad news. I'll get to the good news. The bad news is, while we're here on this earth, you're gonna have things to doubt. You're gonna have things to wrestle with. You're gonna have questions. You're gonna have search, search situations and questions and problems that are gonna lead you to doubt and ponder. The good news is Jesus walks with you. The good news is what happens next. There's a difference between doubt and unbelief. So we'll start with this, laying a framework for where we're going to go. If you have doubts, or certainly if you even know somebody who does, this series is for you. So what do I do when I have doubts? I wanna challenge you to do what the disciples did in verse 16. They showed up. I'm not talking about just at church. That helps. I'm glad you're here. This is a good place to start. But I'm telling you, in your faith journey, keep showing up to your prayer life, to opening the word of God, to having that devotion, to reaching out to a God who you don't yet fully grasp and understand. Keep showing up. The disciples had doubts, but they showed up to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. Keep being obedient. Keep serving. Keep praying. Keep loving people the way God's called you to love people. Keep being a part of the local body of Christ, the family God's called you to here at Midway or wherever your church family may be. Keep showing up. That's a great starting place for when you have doubts. There's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Number two, I love number two because it, it just strikes me that these two can go together. But number two from verse 17, we see that worship and doubt can coexist. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a minute. Some of you thought that worship, I can't really worship if I'm doubting something. Some of you felt like, I've, I've heard people all the time, let me give you an example. I've heard people often say, well, I, I can't take communion. By the way, commanded by God, do this. He didn't say, kind of if you don't have some doubts and feel like it that day, do this in remembrance of me. He said, do this in remembrance of me. But I know people, and I've been this person. I'm not throwing stones at people that I haven't carried around my own self here that won't take communion because they're wrestling with something in their faith or they don't feel worthy. Now, no doubt, Scripture is very clear. We should know the significance of a moment like communion, but it should, listen, your sense of doubt and questioning and feeling of worthiness because of how you have or haven't done things should never preclude you from anything that God's family has been asked to participate in. So maybe some of you will participate in communion in the next month or so when we have it corporately again. We offer it every week in our prayer room. Some people take it every week. Maybe today's your day. You should do that. Maybe it's time for you to step past some doubt because God's ready to meet you there because listen, worship and doubt can coexist. You're like, well, that's your opinion. No, nope. Jesus showed it because he shows up to this mountain where he called his disciples and they, verse 17, two things happen. They see him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, if I was God, I would be like, get out of here. Y'all still look at me. You're going to doubt this. Aren't you glad I'm not God? <laughs> Jesus doesn't do that. I'm going to show you that in the next verse. But here in verse 17, some worship and some doubted. Worship, doubt, all in the same place. I wonder if today your time of worship has been filled with doubt, and they coexisted today. And maybe you've never heard a preacher say, God will meet you even when that combination is real for you. What are your doubts? What are your doubts? What do you have doubts about? Be honest with yourself. Don't tell me. Definitely don't tell your neighbor. They, they look a little sketchy. <laughs> what do you have doubts about? As you worship and show up with obedience to the mountains to which God has called you, you're gonna see that those two things can coexist because God will meet you right in the middle of both of them. Think about the absurdity when you think about doubts, I dealt with this heavily in my own journey. The absurdity of the Jesus story from a logical, rational perspective, that God, because sinful humanity needed a perfect savior, chose to become human, but did so through a virgin who conceived the Son of God through the Holy Spirit. He was a real boy who never sinned. He died taking on 
the sin of humanity as a sinless savior. And then he rose from the dead. And he started this big movement that has overtaken the world. And it's changed everything. And he ascends to go back to the Father. Don't you believe? (laughs) From a logical perspective, that just doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? You can say that in church. God knows. He wrote the script. (laughs) Because he wanted to do something so counter what our minds could conjure up on our own (laughs) to show that it truly is a work of God, this thing of salvation. And with that, as we worship him, Doubts are gonna creep in and be a part of that. I'm so thankful for people who've been patient with me in my doubt journey. (laughs) I've had so many doubts, even as a pastor. Listen, even when I don't doubt God or the word of God, I doubt me all the time. I doubt the calling of God on my life all the time. Every Sunday before I preach, you may not know this about me, I get on my knees every Sunday. I say that not boastfully, I say it because it's a necessity for me. Because I know every time I get one of these little microphones and I'm supposed to talk, the only way it can happen is if God does it through me because I don't talk in front of people. Still, that's who I am. I was a shy, awkward, backward kid. There's no way I'm gonna be a preacher. And I get on my knees every time I preach to remind myself, God doesn't need it. He does what he wants, however he wants, with whomever he wants. But to remind myself that anything God wants to do in my life is only through him. It's a humbling thing. I doubt that. I look in the mirror every time I get to preach and I say, God, couldn't you find somebody better than this? (laughs) It's true. But God uses people, even in their doubts. When you doubt yourself, you doubt that forgiveness is real, like the video you saw, worship and doubt often coexist. Let's write down number three. Keep showing up, keep worshiping, even when you have doubts. Number three, doubts don't disqualify you from discipleship. Aren't you glad? You say, why are you talking about discipleship? Well, the journey of faith is known as being a disciple, a follower of Jesus. I wanna show you that. Here in verse 18, though, we see the beginning of that statement of the Great Commission where Jesus said, so what does Jesus do? Think about this. What did Jesus do? He saw their worship, yes, but he saw their doubt. What did he do? Well, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. It's like, "Uh uh-oh, this is not gonna go well. If I'm them, I'm thinking, he knows I'm doubting, And so all authority means he's kicking me out of this game. Nope. Then you know what he does? Come here, I'm gonna tell you, let you in on a secret of scripture that maybe you've never noticed. In this verse, God chose doubters to build his church. What an amazing concept. Doubt does not disqualify me from being a disciple who makes disciples. God chooses doubters. In fact, if you believe that true faith is the absence of doubt, then the moment you inevitably have some doubts, your faith crumbles and falls apart. That doesn't sound like much of a faith, does it? That's not much of a foundation. But I came to tell you today that faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is trusting God through the doubts. And when I have them, it doesn't disqualify me from being a disciple who makes disciples. So what do you do? I don't speak to parents particularly, but probably you have somebody in your life that may have some doubts. Let's say you don't have them for a little season. Guess what? They're coming. You won't be disqualified then, but what do we do? We've talked about what do I do when I have doubts. What do I do when others in my life have doubts? Parents, let me tell you. Listen, I've gotten so many things wrong as a parent, (laughs) but one thing I pray I'm trying to do well is not overreacting when my kids struggle with things. I got a teenager. Yeah, I got a teenager. It's a different ball game, isn't it? The core of that baseball looks all different. Doesn't it? <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, next service, I'm gonna have the privilege of baptizing my son. Yeah. <laughs> Along with six other amazing people. <laughs> and my son went to a, a conference. You, won't, you may not be here, so I want you to hear this story, because it's so exactly what I hope God can do in me and through us as leaders in others' lives. Uh, And he he went to a conference with the youth group here at Midway, and God, he rededicated his life to Christ, gave his life to Jesus at a young age, was baptized kind of privately in a swimming pool. We had just moved to Indiana, didn't have all the connections there yet, so did it here with family. It was a beautiful moment. But at MOVE conference, Jesus, Jesus really led Caleb to rededicate his life to him. He was wrestling with doubt. And Easter, This past Saturday night, a week ago, Easter service, we get home, 
And Caleb comes up to me and says, Dad, I need to talk to you. I'm exhausted. Second Easter service, got three the next morning. And man, God did amazing things that evening. He said, well, Dad, I need to talk to you. We went outside. He said, Dad, I was supposed to come forward when you did that invitation at the end, when you asked people to come stand at the front. I, I should have come forward. But I knew I lived with a pastor, so I figured I'd just talk to you here. <laughs> True story. That's my kid right there. That is him. <laughs> Woo, that was amazing. Then tears started streaming down his face. And he shared with me. And we've been talking about his doubts and his questions. And, and he said, I feel like God wants me to do publicly in front of my whole church what I did kind of privately before. <laughs> my 13-year-old. And I thought, good Lord, I'm getting something right in this equation. Thank you, Lord. And so that's what he's doing in this next service. But I'm gonna tell you, when I look back at his journey, and it's just beginning, he's owning his faith. That's what's happening. That's, by the way, what we hope. We're doing a whole series on owning your faith after this series. Just so you know, we're talking about apologetics. We got a, a world-renowned apologist, Dr. Frank Turek, is gonna be with us. We got the president of Tripp McConnell University is gonna be here sharing his story in that series. You don't wanna miss it. That's coming up after this series, but when I look back at Caleb's journey, and if you're dealing with a child or a grandchild or someone in your life who is wrestling with doubt, here's what I wanna challenge you to do. Two things wrapped up in just four words. Here it is, don't panic. Be patient. I get a lot wrong with my son, but I did try to because I had a good model for that in my own life when he said, Dad, I'm not sure if I really believe this about the Bible or that this could have actually happened. I didn't go, <gasps> What did you say? You know, I, I said, let's talk about that. I've had a lot of doubts about that too. He looked at me like, but you're a preacher. I'm not sure. <laughs> Can you do that? And we've just wrestled with it. And I'm so thankful for people who've done that in my life. So if you've got somebody that's doubting in your life, don't panic. Just be patient. Go on the journey with them because doubt doesn't disqualify you from discipleship. I would even say to you, doubt is a part of your discipleship journey, which leads me to number four. Write this down. Discipleship is that. It is a journey, not a destination. Discipleship is a journey. We're not called to make decisions for Jesus. I'm glad when people make decisions, but that's the beginning. Our shirts for baptism say all things new. No, what we're called to do is make disciples of Jesus. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. So then he tells them what to do. He's dealing with their doubt, but he says, here's what I want you to do. I know you got doubts. He didn't even say it. He just busted right through that doubt. He's good at that, isn't he? He says, so go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Do you know what the literal translation of the word go, in English it just says go, is literally translated as you are going. Make disciples as you are going. It's a continued thing that just continues to happen as you are going. As you are going through life, make disciples. As you are going through those long grocery store lines, make disciples. As you are dealing with your children who have doubt, make disciples. As you go through times of turmoil and doubt in your life, make disciples. As you are going, discipleship is not a destination we arrive at. It's a journey that God calls us to go on. As we are going, we make disciples. So I'd say it to you this way. Discipleship is not a course you take. It's the course of your life. We have discipleship courses. In fact, the newest one that I'm so excited, we just rolled it out last week, our discipleship pathway. Talk about discipleship being a journey. It's a pathway. It's a leading to the next step and the next step. You can go to midwaychurch.com, and at the top, you're gonna find their discipleship pathway. It's online. We're launching it online first, and then it's gonna be launched in person through some different venues at some point here at Midway as well. But you can start right now. It's free. You just sign up, create a login, and we've got videos, and we walk through step-by-step step how to help you encounter Jesus, live like him, and lead like him. It's a journey to help you own your faith, but it doesn't end. We say that that curriculum, that course, is actually circular, it never ends because once you finish step three, you need to take somebody else through the steps. And guess what? When they go through all the steps, they're called to take somebody else while you walk somebody else on that journey. We're called to be disciples who make disciples. It's the course of our life, not just a course that we take. It's not just the books. I love the books. I love the studies. I got a whole office full of them. <laughs> but that's not enough because information without application is just stagnation. Maybe Christianity has been an intellectual exercise for you and God says it's time for it to go from something that's intellectual to something that's 
applied to your life, that's dynamic in your life. In fact, the word Christian, do you know it's only used three times in the New Testament? It's a good word, it's a descriptive word. It's an accurately descriptive word. But the word disciple is used over some 260 something times in the Bible, do you know that? A lot more than the word Christian because description is found in the word Christian, but dynamics are found in the word disciple. It's a dynamic word that leads us to application in our journey. Christian is who we are, but man, what we do and what it looks like is that we are a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And what you'll find is that word, mathetuo, make what? Make disciples. We define it this way at Midway, Matthew 4, 19. A disciple is one, Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. A disciple is one who is following Jesus, he said, follow me. A disciple is one who is being ongoing, as you are going, changed by Jesus. He said, I will make you. He didn't say, you go make yourself. I will make you what? Fishers of men. Disciples one who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. That's how we define it here. That word, mathetuo, it's interesting. How do we define success at Midway Church? Well, it's not just numbers. Numbers have names, and we celebrate, we track, we steward all the numbers of people and dollars and buildings and square footage, everything. But man, that's not really our biggest metric. Our biggest metric is discipleship. We get our English word mathematics from this Greek word mathetuo. Isn't that interesting? It's a metric for us to measure success, what church should actually look like. But it's not a course we take. It's the course of life. Discipleship is not some destination. It's a journey God's called us to. And as we do it, we're gonna be baptizing. He says, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. While we have a baptism Sunday, next Sunday, we're baptizing seven in the next service, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And then we get to the end of verse 20, and that's where I wanna land with number five. Here it is. Number five, God's love is never in doubt. I just wanna let that simmer in the crock pot for a moment. There's a lot of things you do doubt, But my friend, God's love is never, ever, 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 ever in doubt. Even through their doubt, here's how Jesus dealt with them. He met them even though they were doubting. They were obedient. They showed up. They weren't in unbelief, but they had doubts. And now they weren't disqualified from this journey of discipleship. And then what does Jesus wanna leave them with in this encounter? Verse 20 says, and I am with you always. That's a really complex, deep word in the original language. You know what it means? Always. It means no matter what. It means even when you have doubt. It means even when you think God's not there. It means even when God feels a million miles away, the promise of the Great Commission is that Jesus says to you, no matter what you face, I am with you always to the end of the age, and you can take it to the bank. God's love is never in doubt. He sees you where you're at. Give him some praise if you believe it. He knows what you're going through. He knows the doubts you face, but he meets you in the middle of your doubts because his love is never in doubts. Have you ever had it occur to you that God never doubts his love for you, even though you have doubts about him? That's a powerful thought there, isn't it? God never doubts his love for you. Like, I don't know about that Kevin today. Man, I feel that way all the time. God doesn't go, I, don't, I think, I, man, the love meter went down on that boy today. He, mm-mm. No. Think about it this way. There's nothing you could do that would make God love you more. And there's nothing you could do that would make God love you less. It's a pretty amazing thing. This faith, this journey of discipleship is not a performance-based one. Man, performance comes out of it for sure, but we get it out of order, don't we? We say, I gotta clean up first before I can become a disciple, before I can go to church, before I can be baptized. You hear all those things. Listen, my friend, start with Jesus. Bring your doubts to him. Come to Jesus. He will meet you right where you are. Doubt will do one of two things. Doubt will drive you toward your faith or away from your faith. What the enemy wants to use for evil to drive you away from faith in Jesus, today in Jesus' name, I declare over you, let it drive you to your knees. Let it drive you to trusting the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Maybe you've been trusted in government, 
politics and your own ability and your career and your bank account and somebody else, another person. It's time to put all that aside and say, God's love for me is never in doubt. I'm gonna trust him. I'm gonna let my doubts drive me to him. So here's the invitation, twofold for you today. First of all, I wanna challenge you. The best place we can offer you at Midway Church to wrestle and struggle through your questions and doubts is not in here. It's a good start. I thought that'd get your attention. I want you to come back. I hope you don't leave. Come back next week. We're gonna keep going. This is a good springboard, but it's really not the best place we could offer you. The best place we could offer you to wrestle with your doubts are life groups. So if you're not in one, I wanna challenge you to find one. We'd love to help you with that. You can grab one of the cards in the seats around you and say, I wanna find a life group. You can give it to somebody to my left and you're right as you leave online. There's a link in the description. You fill out that same card. Say, I'm ready to jump into a life group. You can go to midwaychurch.com slash life groups to find one. Here's the other thing. Some of you look at me for a minute. You've been hiding. And it's time for you to lead a life group. We are growing so much that we need at least 15 new life groups by this fall. And we have got an amazing plan to help train you up. Listen, you're not gonna do it by yourself. You're gonna be with co-leaders. We're gonna give you all that you need. You've got uh, these amazing care leaders that'll pour into your life through this journey. If you go to midwaychurch.com slash life groups, or there's a table for life groups right out my left, your right, you'll find our discipleship team there. They'll get you plugged in. Maybe it's time to lead one. Or if you just need to find one, do that too. But we need you. Jump in. We wanna create these spaces to wrestle with doubt. Last but not least, some of you need to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's time for you to say this. Here it is. The statement of the day as we begin this series is, I have my doubts, but my doubts will not have me. In Jesus' name. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes today? Maybe you need to trust Jesus today and you say, I've got my doubts, but today I'm gonna lay them down at the foot of the cross and trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. As believers are praying, some of you right now need to trust in Jesus. Maybe you need to say something like this from your heart to his. A prayer won't save you, but your heart being surrendered to him will. You need to say, Jesus, today I give you me. Say this. I ask you, will you save me? I have my doubts, that's for sure. Thank you for meeting me in my doubts. Will you forgive me? I know you died for me and rose again. I trust you and you alone for salvation. If that's you, whatever words you use, the heavens are rejoicing right now. I'm gonna pray for you, then we're gonna celebrate all of your next steps. Listen, there's a QR code on the screen, a link in the description. If you just prayed to receive Jesus, maybe you need to be baptized, fill out the card that's in your seat or online in that link and let us no, we've got people outside these doors that would love to pray with you, people in the chat online as well. Let's go on this journey of discipleship together. And aren't you glad we're not disqualified because we have doubts? They may feel like the waves of the ocean, but God is our horizon. His love never changes. God, thank you today for those who have said yes to you. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the fact you meet us in our doubts. God, we love you, we praise you. I pray for those who have given their life to Jesus. I pray they take those next steps. We thank you for your disciples, and that you've called us to be one of those. We welcome people today to your family, joining with the angels in heaven who celebrate now. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's welcome people to God's family today and give God some praise. Yes. Thank you for listening and tuning in. I wanna ask Pastor Todd to come with a special family moment of one of our favorite staff members. Isn't that right, Pastor Absolutely. Todd? Absolutely. Right. Thank come you, on, Pastor Camille. Kevin. Great word this morning, deconstructing doubt. I wanna wrap up today uh, by just reminding all of us that there's always a group of people in the background who are serving, making things happen. And 20 years ago, I sat down to interview Camille Donaldson and David, I think we were at Applebee's, and I, I was uh, in desperate need of some help and was looking for a personal assistant. And I'll never forget, we've laughed about this many times, I remember asking Camille, can I, can I speak and can we talk about things and speak about things? Can I speak plainly without hurting your feelings? And David snickered. And, and her response was, can I speak to you plainly without hurting your feelings? <laughs> and I said, absolutely. And I said, it's a deal. And so we've been serving side by side together for these last 20 years. She now not only serves, uh, she, she for many years serves as my assistant today, she's also over all of our finances, all of our human resources for our church. We have over 40 employees now and um, uh, 
several million dollars come through. Uh, we are audited every year in one way or another by an outside firm and have been for many years. She dots all of her I's, crosses all of her T's, and we always get a great report. And much of the confidence that you have to be able to give to Midway Church, knowing that things are accounted for in a really great manner, uh, is because of Camille Donaldson. And I want to thank you, Camille, for these last 20 years together, and uh, it's been an absolute joy, and we haven't hurt each other's feelings yet, but we still love each other and are having a blast. So would you help me thank her for her service here at Midway Church? That's right. Go ahead. There you are. She's deserving of that. So we hope you feel the love. Been a, been a great, great journey together. And she isn't wrapping up. She says, just because you're leaving doesn't mean I'm leaving, all right, uh, from these key roles. But anyway, thank you guys very much. Have a great week. We love you. Bring somebody back with you next week.
Thank mm-hmm. you.